Josephson junctions and squids. No, 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 not those squids. We're talking about superconducting quantum interference devices. Squids. In this video, we're going to work through some basic theory, electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, and superconductivity, before diving into the how and why Josephson junctions work. Then, we'll turn our focus to the squids, and how they work to detect even the smallest magnetic fields. As you all know, there are four equations that live in infamy, the Maxwell equations. The governing bodies of all things electromagnetic, brought to you by the great Gauss, Faraday, and Ampere, with a contribution from Maxwell himself, will be our first step into discovering how squids work. We're going to look at Ampere's law in particular, in as much that both a changing electric field or a surface current can cause a magnetic field. This is demonstrated in the following simple experiment. Take a straight wire and pass a current through it. The current generates a magnetic field around the wire according to Ampere's law, which tells us the direction and strength of the magnetic field given our input current. This magnetic field is constant, and that's going to give us some complications. So now it's evident that a current can cause a magnetic field. But the opposite's a bit trickier. If you've ever had the pleasure of putting two inductors nearby each other and passing current through one, you'll notice that the other inductor only produces a current when the magnetic flux changes, generating what's called an electromotive force, EMF, like Faraday's law prescribes. The EMF is given by the negative time derivative of the magnetic flux over some surface sigma, as you can see in these equations. This is disappointing. That means we cannot speed up or slow down charges with a static magnetic field. This is very important to note as we will be referring to it in our discussion on squids. Let us shift our discussion briefly to quantum mechanics. The only part of this huge field that we'll need is the concept of quantum tunneling. Looking at only one dimension, we can imagine a potential like so. Here, we've introduced a rather tall but thin barrier at z equals zero. Let's also introduce a particle with energy lower than the potential needed to get over the barrier. Classically, this particle has no chance of getting through. Think of a ball trying to roll up a hill. It cannot pass over the hill if it does not have more kinetic energy at the bottom than potential energy at the top. Typically, the perceived phenomenon is the ball making it to a point and then rolling back down. In our thought experiment, we've made a few assumptions. Firstly, the ground is frictionless, and secondly, the ground prevents the ball from sinking into it. In our experience, if we have a very, very heavy ball, it can push things in front of it to the side as it goes towards its destiny. The kinetic energy is so large that it doesn't seem to lose any when it collides with other objects in front of it. So what happens if we roll this ball against our hill? Our super heavy ball can break one of the assumptions that we've held originally. It has enough inertia to displace the dirt of the hill, allowing it to tunnel through and get to the other side, albeit with a little bit less energy. We said this energy is actually lost due to absorption from the hill. This, essentially, is what quantum tunneling is all about. Any particle has a chance to tunnel through a non-infinite potential barrier while suffering an exponential decay in its kinetic energy. Lastly, we're going to do a quick rundown on one of the most important features of superconductivity, zero electrical DC resistance. Once a metal reaches its superconducting phase, all DC resistances that it offers suddenly stop. Any current that was running in the wire, or are induced later, persists for what appears to be an eternity, as long as the wire stays superconducting. The reason these metals are able to offer no resistance is due to the formation of things called Cooper pairs. They arise when two electrons are weakly bound together thanks to a phonon exchange. Cooper pairs actually have an energy gap that needs to be overcome in order to break this bond. Normally, the thermal energy in the lattice is enough to break it, but when the temperature is so ridiculously low, the Cooper pairs can't be broken and can move along their merry way without ever getting scattered. Recall that connectivity, sigma, is defined on basis of the electron scattering time, tau. If the electrons never collide with anything, then tau is infinite, and so is sigma, meaning that our resistivity, rho, drops to zero, and our macroscale resistance, r, also drops to zero. We have superconductivity. Now to the fun part. The Josephson effect is what happens when you have supercurrent flowing from one superconductor to another through a weak link. This link could be an insulator, a section of non-superconducting metal, or just the kink in the superconductor that causes the superconductivity to weaken a little bit. These three types of Josephson junctions mostly differ on how thick the barrier is, but let's focus on the insulator version to get an intuition. Through a lot of math, we can find that on each side of the insulator, the wave function is just an amplitude times a phase. This Josephson phase is defined to be the difference in phase between the two superconductors and seems to govern most of the behaviors of the Josephson junction. While the voltage depends on the time derivative of the Josephson phase, the current depends instead sinusoidally upon it. 
The Justice Injunction is known to cause three particular effects. The DC effect, which is due to the tunneling of electrons, and varies between negative IC and IC. The AC effect, where using a fixed voltage causes the phase to vary linearly, and the current to oscillate with a known amplitude and frequency. As such, you're able to convert voltage to frequency. The IV characteristics of a Justice Injunction are rather interesting. There is a line at V equals zero representing the DC Josephson effect, while as you go further away, there are large values that the current takes on is due to the finiteness of the superconductor band gap. We're finally ready to talk about squids. A squid is composed of a single wire that's split into two and then rejoined to form a loop. Each side of the loop is fitted with the Josephson Junction and the current is passed along the system. Normally, the current would split across both branches equally, but if we introduce an external magnetic field that threads the hole, it will form a screening current based on the magnetic field. This means that one side will have more current flowing than the other, and once one side has a current greater than IC, that just the same junction will acquire a voltage. Hold on, we've already established that we need a changing magnetic field to cause an electric field. And that's correct! However, squids have an interesting phenomenon occur. If the magnetic flux is over half a flux quanta, phi naught, then the squid, wanting an integer number of phi's, will push current such that the total flux is an integer number. Similarly, when the flux is less than half a quanta, it will push current such that the total flux is zero, providing a measurable current shift. As such, the magnetic field isn't causing this current. The squid is assigning more current to one branch to cancel or enhance the flux to achieve an integer flux quanta. As such, the measured current flips between directions as the flux increases. One can actually measure the applied flux through the screening current. Thanks to Ohm's law, the resultant voltage is actually given by, in this case, R is the shunt resistance applied across the junction to eliminate hysteresis, and L is the self-inductance of the superconducting ring. So, with this, and several days of waiting, it's possible to measure magnetic fields as small as 10 to the 8th tesla, with noise levels near 10 to the minus 32 tesla per square root hertz. This absurd level of detail can easily measure the magnetic fields animals produce, and the squid serves as one of the best magnetometers out there.